Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Strategies for Reporting Qualitative Evaluations. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate advances evaluation in the community by offering trainings, cultivating a network, researching emerging topics, and collecting data about the ATE program. Be sure to check out Evaluate's website to learn more. The slides from the, this webinar are already on Evaluate's website, along with several other resources. The recording will be available in a couple of days, and that will be emailed to you. I'm Emma Binder. I'll be presenting today along with Alyssa wilson Becho. We will both work at Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. We'd like to recognize our Evaluate team who has worked behind the scenes to help bring this webinar to you today. And a special thanks goes out to Marjorie Wajnagy and Joseph Brust, our two ATE community reviewers who provided valuable feedback at our webinar rehearsal, and also our editor, Carolyn williams Noren. This webinar is designed for individuals funded by the National Science Foundation's Advanced Technological Education Program, or ATE for short. The webinar program, it, the ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. It funds projects in high-tech areas like advanced manufacturing, engineering technologies, IT, nanotechnologies, and so on. This is a good time to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. Now I'm going to hand it over to Lisa to get us started. To be here with you all today to talk about strategies for reporting qualitative evaluations. So today's webinar has three parts. First, we want to get everyone on the same page with a quick introduction to what we mean when we say qualitative evaluation. Then we're gonna talk about trustworthiness and transparency in reporting qualitative data. So by this, we mean how to write about your methods and your data in a way that makes readers trust the findings and conclusions. Finally, reporting qualitative data is not all about data visualization and design, but our third section will focus on just that, strategies for reporting qualitative data. So before we jump into our first section, we wanna start off with a poll question for you all. So the question is, how frequently do you use qualitative data in your evaluations? Is it all the time, frequently, rarely, or never? If you are not an evaluator, you can also respond about how frequently you receive evaluation reports that use qualitative data. So if a poll tab didn't appear to the right side of your screen, you can navigate to that tab by clicking poll at the top of the screen. But I see a number of you are already answering right now, so that poll should be up and live. We'll give a few seconds for people to answer, but it's looking like uh, most people, about 50%, uh, frequently use qualitative data, with 35% saying that they use qualitative data in their evaluations all the time, and another 13, 14% of, of folks joining us today who say they use it rarely or never. Well, I think that's a pretty good spectrum of familiarity with qualitative data. And know that the strategies that we discussed today are useful for evaluations that are fully qualitative, but also for mixed methods evaluations that only have some qualitative data. So let's jump into things. So we, like I said before, I wanna spend a few minutes just giving uh, an introduction and overview of qualitative evaluation to get everyone on the same page before we talk about the strategies for reporting that qualitative evaluation. So qualitative evaluation is often described as an approach that allows in-depth understanding of a project. It allows us to take a deeper look at the why and how a project works. Qualitative data puts faces to numbers and statistics, and it highlights the lived experiences of participants in their own voices. And perhaps most obvious, it uses qualitative methods. So many times qualitative data is compared to a story. So here in this quote from Michael Quinn Patton, he says, evaluation case studies have all of the elements of a good story. They tell what happened when, to whom, and with what consequences. A qualitative evaluation still measures both the process and the outcomes of a project, 
but it does so using narratives, descriptions, and participant voices. So I want to clear up some misconceptions right up front about the use of qualitative data for NSF ATE evaluations. So yes, the National Science Foundation does consider stories a form of data. Yes, you can include these stories and qualitative data in your NSF annual reports and in your evaluation reports. And yes, qualitative data can contribute to the generation of knowledge and evidence. So I've heard from project staff and evaluators that sometimes they shy away from planning or using qualitative data in their evaluations because they don't think it lives up to the definition of evidence or is not considered rigorous enough. So today I wanna to challenge those assumptions and demonstrate that a good qualitative study can be worth paying attention to. So let's look at two very brief examples of a quantitatively oriented evaluation report and a qualitatively oriented report. So both of these examples are evaluations of a transition program for first generation students. The quantitative report reads that the project served 23 first generation college students, six of whom were black, four of whom were Hispanic, 90% of the students said that they were satisfied with the program, and 50% of the students remained in the STEM program after two years, but none of these students that remained in the STEM program were black or Hispanic. The qualitative report reads that the program staff were supportive and friendly. I probably would have dropped out if it wasn't for them. So this quote comes from Jim, a first generation college student who identifies as white and who went on to graduate with a STEM degree. However, Aaron, a black student, didn't have the same connection to the project staff. His quote reads, I just never felt like I belonged there. I couldn't see myself working in the field. I wish there were mentors more like, more mentors like me. So even in these short paragraphs, you can see that the qualitative report demonstrates why and how the project is working and not working. It puts a face to the statistics using participant voices. Often in evaluation, we find that a mixed method study does the best job of answering both the what and the why questions. Including the quantitative and qualitative data in the same report allows readers to see the full story of what's going on. So although today's webinar is called qualitative evaluations, the strategies we discussed today are applicable to mixed method evaluations as well. So this webinar does not go into depth about qualitative data and collection methods or analysis techniques, but I just wanted to give you a quick overview. So when we say qualitative data collection methods, the primary methods we're talking about are um, observations, interviews, focus groups, even surveys can collect qualitative information, document reviews or media reviews. So this could be reviews of photos, videos, or even artwork. And while there are a lot of analysis techniques and approaches for qualitative data, a primary one is called thematic analysis. So to put it very simply, this approach involves the review and sorting of data into codes, which then are aggregated into themes. So this allows evaluators to identify patterns and meaning in data that come from interviews, observations, or those open-ended survey questions we talked about before. So I know this was a really quick overview, but if you wanna learn more about qualitative evaluation approaches, data collection methods, or qualitative analysis techniques, we do have some additional resources for you on our webpage. Another great way to discuss qualitative data collection or analysis techniques is to reach out to an ATE evaluation coach. So Evaluate offers free one-on-one -on -one coaching to anyone who's associated with an ATE project. Take advantage of this peer-to-peer -peer opportunity to review a data collection instrument or really just to brainstorm ideas with someone else. You can see our website for more information. So we're gonna pause here for a minute for our first question break. And we're actually gonna do something new on this webinar is we are actually gonna go ahead and turn on our cameras to be a little bit more personable. So if you have questions, please go ahead and throw them in the chat box. And we uh, will, I'm gonna pass it over to Emma to facilitate these questions. Absolutely, thanks, Lissa. We actually just had a question come in from Michael. He said, as you look at comments from students, is it easy to, is it easy, I suppose, to select some that you like, but how can you choose that they are representative? Maybe that is beyond the scope today. <laughs> 
wary about using qualitative methods is because they're afraid that it doesn't come off as systematic or rigorous or trustworthy. And so I think there are a lot of ways you can ensure that in the methods and how you're collecting data and how you're analyzing that data. We're not going to go into that in details today. However, we are going to talk about how you can highlight what you did in your evaluation report. So how are you demonstrating that trustworthiness of your data to make sure that you didn't just cherry pick quotes out, kind of like you're saying. So we're going to talk about that in today's webinar. All right, and then we have another one that came in from Jovita. She said, they said, what is the difference between content analysis versus thematic analysis? That is a great uh, analytical technique question. And so we're not going to get into the details of that. There actually is a really great um, resource on the website, which I'm sure my colleague Anna can throw in the chat just so we know where that is located. Um, but there's a really great overview of these different analysis techniques. Um, I, can, I can suggest some books that would be really helpful, but I think that this open access website does a really good job of overviewing these, these techniques pretty simply. And those are the two questions that we had come in uh, during this question break. As always, if you have additional questions, feel free to let us know in the chat box. I do see oh. one more yep. question Sorry. in the chat box Someone about, rolling in. Yeah, about free software for thematic analysis. Um, a lot of the software that we do tend to use is, is paid, so things like uh, InVivo or MaxQDA. Um, but there are a few free ones, actually, uh, and I can look those up during Emma's portion and put those in the chat. I believe there's a, a really interesting one that just caught, came out called Duarte, I think is what's, no, that's not, I'm confusing the name with something else. So let me look it up and, and I'll respond to that question in the chat. And we got another one from Rebecca. She said, can you share the quote again you used in the beginning? I believe that would be Patton's quote. I can, I will throw that in the chat as well. And then we had another one from Coral that said, how can you be in a member of ATE? So I think there's two different things. So if you are funded by the NSF Advanced Technological Education Program or the ATE program, meaning you either have received a grant um, or you're being funded somehow through that grant. And so if you are an evaluator and interested in evaluating an ATE program, reach out to us after the webinar because we would love to connect you with uh, people who are submitting proposals this upcoming year. All right, yeah. I know that, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, do we have time for one more? We do. Yeah, we've got one more from Becky. She said, do you have any tips or tricks for making qualitative analysis more efficient? All my tools require hours of person power versus quick analysis of qualitative data. I can run through SPSS or even Excel. And I'm sorry, I misspoke quantitative. Yeah, Becky, I think you're putting your finger on something that comes up a lot is the resource constraints around qualitative analysis in particular, because it does take time to really sit with that data and interpret it but there are some really cutting edge techniques around rapid qualitative analysis. And so a lot of those techniques are very participatory and, uh, and have members from the group or participants of the, of the program come in and help uh, code and sort those, that data. So in many ways, it's an analysis technique and a member checking technique, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit as well. And we'll just take this last one from Randy, he said, for NSF reporting, is there a good balance you can recommend between quant and qual methods in the eval? I always think whichever methods you choose should really match the questions that you're asking. So my, my question back to you would be about what are your evaluation questions and what's the best way to answer those? But I think looking at questions, you want to make sure that you have some process questions, some outcome questions, and recognize that you want the, that descriptive analysis of what is happening, which um, can sometimes be easily captured with quantitative data, but really explaining the why and the how behind that. So um, having those quotes, having those descriptions can really help add detail and understanding to your evaluation. All right, we'll keep those questions coming. We will have two more question breaks coming up in our next two sections. We'll go ahead and pass it over back to Lissa. All right, wonderful. Let's see. So to get us started on this next section um, and get you thinking about reporting qualitative 
evaluations, we want to ask you a chat question. So what is the most difficult part about reporting qualitative data in evaluation? Or if you're the recipient of an evaluation report, what do you find the most difficult to understand when you're reading a qualitative evaluation report? So again, you can use the chat box on the right side of your screen to respond. So Rebecca says, keeping things concise. Yes, I think that's really hard a lot of times with qualitative um, data because there's just, you want to get into the detail about things. I see time management, moving beyond quotes. That's a really good one as well. Qualitative data viz. So that's definitely something that we're going to talk about today. Synthesizing without losing the richness. I think reporting qualitative data sometimes is so difficult because we know our readers are really busy. Um, and they're not going to read a full 50 page report. But if we're really coming at evaluation from a qualitative standpoint, from a constructivist paradigm, you really want that rich, lengthy description as well. So I see comments about um, how to present it, the visuals, less text heavy. Sometimes it feels like there's a contradiction here. So how are we being true to our qualitative data without quantifying it in a way? Yeah, these are really great. So I hope that today's webinar um, gives you some ideas of dealing with these things, but we are right there with you. We think that reporting qualitative evaluations can be really difficult. So reporting qualitative evaluations isn't all about design or data visualization strategies, but you also want to ensure that the report communicates the evaluation's trustworthiness and its transparency. So one concern that I hear about the use of evaluation, qualitative evaluation approaches is that the data and findings won't be considered rigorous or valid. So this is kind of what we talked about in the question and answer section, but that the stakeholders just won't trust a qualitative approach or assume that the data collection and analysis were held to a lesser standard. So this is not necessarily true. Qualitative research methods and evaluation approaches have their own standards for trustworthiness and transpar transparency that must be followed and are particularly important to showcase in your evaluation report. So people tend to be more familiar with the criteria for assessing the quality of a quantitative methodologies. So these include concepts such as internal validity. So this is whether the observed changes can be attributed to your program and not to other possible causes. External validity whether that cause and effect relationship generalizes to other settings outside of your project. Reliability, which is the consistency of the findings. And objectivity. So this is whether the evaluation is free from personal bias or subjectivity. So these measures of a good evaluation are dependent on the underlying assumptions and beliefs of quantitative methodologies. But these assumptions change when we take a look at a qualitative approach. So instead of finding the capital T truth of a situation, the aim of trustworthiness in a qualitative inquiry is to endorse the findings as worth paying attention to, as Lincoln and Guba say. The terms validity, reliability, and objectivity, they just don't fit with a qualitative view of the world. Instead, Ivana Lincoln and Egon Guba laid out qualitative criteria for trustworthiness. So these include credibility, dependability, transferability, and confirmability. So let's take a closer look at what each of these mean and how the trustworthiness of the qualitative evaluation can be demonstrated in your evaluation report. So first, credibility refers to the confidence in data accuracy. So the credibility of a qualitative evaluation and evaluator are linked. These are, there are a number of qualitative methods that can establish credibility, which should be articulated within the evaluation report. So first, credibility can be established by the meaningful and prolonged presence of uh, an evaluator at a project. So spending time at the project site, whether that's in person or virtually, really allows an evaluator to speak to the range of people and speak to a range of people and develop relationships and a rapport with project staff and project participants. The evaluator's activities to understand the context and build trust should be described in the background or the method section of an evaluation report. 
So this allows the reader to assess whether the evaluator had enough contextual understanding to make meaningful and credible interpretations. Second, any method taken to member check, triangulate, or interpret findings should be detailed in the method section of your report. So when approached correctly, these methods can really increase the confidence in an evaluation's accuracy. So when I say member checking, member checking is a technique that tests data, findings, or conclusions with members of the group from whom the data were originally obtained. So this could include allowing an interview interviewee to review a transcript or a written summary of their responses. It could include having participants preview findings or interpretation section, sections prior to the final report. Member checking uh, allows participants an opportunity to correct errors, change interpretations, challenge those interpretations, and even volunteer additional information. Triangulation, on the other hand, involves multiple data sources in an evaluation to produce an understanding. So this might involve comparing quantitative and qualitative data on the same topic, or comparing interviews of people with different viewpoints, or even using multiple analysis approaches on the same data. A step-by-step -step description of this process, who was involved and how decisions were made around these techniques should be included in the report method section to demonstrate to readers that care was taken to ensure the correct conclusions. And finally, give attention to deviant cases. So deviant cases are findings that differ from the rest of the expected pattern. Taking a closer look at these outliers can alter, expand, or even confirm emerging patterns in your data. Understanding how these deviant cases fit into current conclusions can help strengthen the conclusion's credibility. So next is dependability. Dependability refers to the stability of data over time and across conditions. Dependability asks, if this evaluation was done again next year, assuming the project did not change drastically, would the primary conclusions be the same? Can we depend on the evaluation conclusions? One way to address dependability is to be clear about who was involved and the justifications behind their selection. So how how did interview participants, how were interview participants chosen and why were they chosen? Sampling strategies in qualitative methods differ in purpose and technique from the quantitative sampling strategies. So it's important to address the reasonings behind your qualitative sampling strategies in your methods section. This allows readers to understand why that technique was chosen and what implications it might have on the findings. So for example, if a convenient sample was taken to focus on a group of participants and only students who were in lab on a Tuesday were invited to participate, the conclusions that result from this data collection may not hold true to students who attend lab on say Wednesday or students who can only participate in a virtual lab. Our third criterion is transferability, which refers to the applicability of data to other contexts. So this is a funny one in qualitative evaluation, as not all evaluators intend their findings to transfer to other settings, times, or projects. So whether this is the intention or not, many readers may want to instinctually apply findings from an evaluation to another project. To determine whether this is appropriate, evaluation reports should describe the project context and background in detail. So this might include descriptions of how a project came to be, background on those involved, the surrounding college or university environments, even values and beliefs of the project staff or participants that might influence the project. So in this report, in the report, I, I often include this in the project background section at the beginning. And while this may seem like a lot of information to include in an evaluation report, qualitative methodologies rely on contextual interpretation of data. So a piece of data for one project might mean something different for another project. And to fully understand those differences, the reader needs to understand the context of an evaluation. The transferability of findings can also be demonstrated through the use of thick descriptions of data. So thick descriptions are similar to what they sound like, detailed accounts of field experience that are couched within the, the patterns of cultural and social relationships. Thick descriptions put qualitative data 
into context and help a reader understand the intended interpretation. So for example, if I told you that someone winked, you would not unnecessarily understand the meaning behind it without additional context. So what were, what were the people talking about? Who is the person that winked and what is their relationship to the person that they winked at? These descriptions would allow you to determine whether the person was trying to secure a secret or if they were trying to flirt. So using thick descriptions to report qualitative findings really allows the reader to assess the potential transferability of findings to other contexts. And finally, confirmability. So confirmability refers to the ability of someone else to follow the decision trail used by an evaluator to determine the extent that findings were uh, determined by eval uh, without evaluator bias. Excuse me. So qualitative evaluations acknowledge that evaluators bring their own values and perspectives and assumptions to an evaluation. So while this is inevitable to some extent, it should be transparent to what extent and in what ways that's true. Many qualitative evaluators and researchers discuss the importance of leaving an audit trail. So this audit trail is a transparent description of the evaluation process and justification for why decisions were made. In many cases, this would be far too much uh, and too detailed of information to include in the body of the report. Therefore, we suggest that you take advantage of the appendices to include these items. So this could be something like coded responses to open-ended survey questions so that readers can see how responses were coded. It could be interview or focus group instruments so that readers understand how questions were asked. Or the process notes relating to methodological rationales or trustworthiness of the data. So depending on your situation, I have even heard of evaluators including de-identified raw data in the appendix for project staff. I know that the external evaluators for our project will include appendices with tables of direct quotes that participants said in open-ended survey questions, along with the analytic, analytic, analytical category or theme that they were placed into. So as a PI, I find some of these the most meaningful parts of the evaluation report because I can really understand in detail what participants are saying with a structure for understanding individual responses in the big picture. Another strategy for demonstrating the confirmability of qualitative evaluation is to declare evaluator biases or assumptions. So just like uh, I acknowledged earlier, the background and context of project staff it is important to understand where the evaluator is coming from. So this can be done through the inclusion of a positionality statement. A positionality statement asks the evaluator to critically reflect on their identities, their worldview, and their underlying assumptions in relation to the evaluation's social and political context. It locates the evaluator in relation to the project and the participants. So this type of statement can shed light on known and unknown lenses that might have influenced the evaluation. So to learn more about a positionality statement and how to write one, see a recent blog um, on the Evaluate website that was written on this topic. So here is an overview of the four criteria for trustworthiness in qualitative evaluation. We have credibility, dependability, transferability, and confirmability. And then below are the different strategies we talked about for demonstrating each in an evaluation report. So I know that that was a lot, but we do have a question break coming up, but I wanna take a few minutes to see which of these strategies would be most convincing to you if you are reading a report of a qualitative evaluation. So in the chat, this chat question is, if you could only choose one, only one of these strategies, which of the strategies would be the most important to you as a reader or an author of an evaluation report? So you can answer in the chat box. I'm actually gonna go ahead and flip back to the previous slide so that you can see the different strategies that we talked about. So I see a lot of people saying that confirmability would be the most important to them. So having this audit trail, being able to really trace what was done throughout that qualitative evaluation. I also see a number of people saying credibility would be the most important to them. So making sure that there was this trust between the project staff and the evaluator 
that methods such as member checking or triangulation were included. I see some that are picking two. I know it's difficult, right? I was interested to see if you could only pick one, which ones are the most important to you. But ideally, you kind of do a patchwork of all of these different strategies together. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for answering that question. Um, right before our next question break, we want to remind you all that Evaluate has a Slack community. So if you want to continue to grapple with these larger questions in an open community of ATE and non-ATE folk, come check us out on Slack. All right, so it's time for our second question break. We're going to go ahead and turn our cameras on and I will hand it over to Emma to facilitate. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lissa. What a great second section we had there. Uh, so the first question we have is from Brittany and they say, what about validation by multiple coders? Yeah, I think having multiple coders um, look at your uh, qualitative coding techniques is a great way to validate the findings and the themes that are coming from that. So specifically in your evaluation report, you would want to make sure that you described in the method section how many coders there were, what technique you chose, and then specifically what happened if coders disagreed. So how did you come to consensus if there was a disagreement among coding? All right, the next question we have from is from Amanda and they say, do you have a sample qualitative evaluation report that we can read through to see how these are played out in practice? A lot of examples of evaluation reports that are all um, open access and available online. Um, specifically, she pulls out examples that talk about the, the design and data visualization strategies but I'm sure that if you looked at these reports that they do some of these methods um, sections around trustworthiness as well. All right, the next question we have is from Giovanna. They say, I'd like to hear more about the idea of dependability. As people's perceptions change over time, the data will probably be different, even with a robust methodology. That speaks of people's perception, not only the research methodology. So do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. You know, these uh, criteria for qualitative evaluations are not the only criteria out there. So in many ways, they actually parallel the qual quantitative criteria that we talked about. And so I, I do think that there's a struggle in there to say that not all of these criteria apply to every single qualitative evaluation or even qualitative study out there. Not all are meant to be the same across time. And some recognize that they're just getting a snapshot of the people there and what they think at that moment. So I think that goes back to describing your context. So making sure that your evaluation report has a detailed description of who was involved, when that happened, and other contextual events surrounding that that might influence their perceptions or their ideas now and what that, how that might change um, in a month or a year or 10 years. Margaret asks, I work with an organization that has a machine learning tool to analyze qualitative data. How do factors like demonstrative worthiness apply in those situations? So interesting, Margaret. You know, Evaluate has just recently wrapped up a a similar study that used a sentiment analysis technique. And so there was a there was a similar process of machine learning in which the algorithms understood phrases and words and phrases and decided if they were positive or negative. And so that actually in many ways you might argue is is more of a quantitative approach because there is this quantitative algorithm behind it. And so I know in our study we did a number of quantitative um, validation techniques to, to test that. Um, and that report we're actually finishing up in the next month or so. So I think that should be available in January and we can share more details on the validation techniques that we took. So interesting, machine learning coming into this. Right. So we've got another one from Joy and they asked, how do you handle responses to open-ended questions that have no relationship to the actual question? For example, they use any and every opportunity in the survey to make the same point, whether it relates to the question or an asked or not. 
you know, whether it's a survey or an interview, there's always this underlying psychology that's happening, right? So your participant is going to, going to answer the way they want to answer. Um, and obviously, if they are saying something over and over again, regardless of the question, they feel it really strongly. So I think my first question would be, um, do multiple people do that or is it just one person? And then making sure that you have a really good systematic approach to handling that. So whether you decide to throw out, um, to not include in your final pattern or theme building analysis, those uh, unrelated um, responses, or if you decide to include them, either way, I think it's just important to be transparent. So like when we're talking about that audit trail, how are you making sure that a reader knows which way you decided and how you dealt with those, those different types of data? All right, Bethany asked tips for evaluating interview reports when interviews were not recorded, appropriate to code talk to interviewees, et cetera. Yes, absolutely. I think this is a great opportunity for member checking in particular, because you don't have exactly what they said. And there's a lot of interpretation on the end of the interviewer, right? So how they heard what happened, how they remembered it, and then how they summarized it. So I think whether you're going to write a full summary of individual interviews, or if you want to write a summary of the findings and conclusions that came from those interviews and share them back with the interviewees. So that's a member checking technique to say, do, is this appropriate? Does this accurately represent what your experience was or how you're thinking about something? It's a great way to add credibility to that approach. Um, let's see, Coral asked, uh... I think it's more of a question slash answer here. So sorry, it's the ATE blog where I'll find info on declaring biases and assumptions from the evaluator slash researcher. So she's asking for clarification on that one. Yeah, so that was a recent blog that I wrote because I realized that we just didn't have enough time in this webinar to talk about it. Um, so uh, I can make, I, Anna just posted the link to the full webinar website and on there, there's a link to that blog. We can get the direct link as well. And so that blog is about writing a uh, positionality statement. And I have seen a lot of people, particularly in qualitative research, talk about this, but I've, I've slowly seen it start to, to enter the evaluation world. But I think it's really important and a great way for evaluators to, like you're saying, declare their biases and assumptions as we recognize that you know, a lot of times you can't be fully objective as an evaluator. You're bringing a lens, you're bringing assumptions with you as an evaluator that do have a way of influencing decisions or analysis techniques or um, how you're interpreting the findings. One last question here from Dennis. They ask, how would you deal with emergent issues that comes out during qualitative data analysis, especially if they differ from the objectives of evaluation and are very powerful or sensitive? Mm, sensitive might be a different answer, but powerful, you know, it makes me think about in investigating deviant cases. So I think it's really important to look at the outliers, to look at things that don't neatly fit within the patterns that we're originally seeing or the, the theories that we are creating. And so making sure that we understand why, what, what led to that different experience or that different perspective um, in a way that helps confirm that you did your best, right? You don't just wanna ignore these, these differing data or emerging issues, um, but I think that there's a good way to to dive into them. Um, if they don't fit within the original objectives of your evaluation, I think you should talk with the project staff and say, you know, this seems really important or sensitive. And if it's sensitive, you can share back with them in more of an oral report instead of a written report. You could also talk to them about actually creating another mini evaluation report that talks about some of these issues that may not fit within the original structure of the initial evaluation plan. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and move us along out of our question break here and into section three. So there we go. So it is, 
sorry about that. So we are going to dig into section three and explore strategies for reporting qualitative data now. So here we have outlined eight different strategies, including word clouds, call out boxes, highlight quotes, tables, annotated graphs, photos, icons, and journey maps. So for each strategy, we will provide an overview, examples from the field, data collection methods, and tools and resources on how to create these visuals. We've also created a handout with all of this information that you can refer to after the webinar. So the first strategy will address our word clouds. Word clouds are popular and you may have already used them or seen them in reports. A word cloud is a visual representation of text data, typically used to visualize free form text. This is an example I put together for this webinar. In order to produce a word cloud, you create a paragraph of text or a list of words. In this example, I created a list of words and created different weights or entries for each word. Qualitative was the most entered and therefore appears as the largest. As you review the word cloud, your eye will slowly start picking out more and more words. So this is a great strategy for quick analysis or a fun way to present findings to clients. We recommend you only use one or two word clouds in a single document since overuse will reduce their effectiveness. So here is an example from a report on informalscience.org where Beckler, Klein, and Fox used a word cloud to answer a question from a survey. The answers were then presented in this word cloud scene. The answers with the largest are the highest responses. And here is another example from the community from informalscience.org where Rockman and colleagues used four word clouds to represent team responses for terms learned in the experience archaeology subsections. So kind of a unique one there. So strategy number two is call out boxes. Call out boxes are a type of text box that also include a line for pointing to any section on a document. So this element can be effective for elaborating a statement with a quote or providing more context. Here is an example of call out boxes in an evaluation report from Informal Science. You can see that Smith used a call out box to include qualitative quotes for specific practices outlined in the report. In this full check in report created by Sickler and colleagues, the call out boxes were a design element to outline answers to qualitative responses. So, highlight quotes are strategy number three. A highlight quote is a section of colored text on a document to call attention. This text can be enlarged, indented, or bolded. This allows for your audience to easily scan for information by using a highlight quote. You are telling your audience that this information is important and should be read. So make sure to consider this when using highlight quotes and be sure to use them sparingly throughout your document. Let's look at some examples together. So here's an example from KQED Public Media, where Berg uses highlight quotes to adding quotes in sections of their evaluation reports. And here is another example from informalscience.org, where Beaumont and colleagues again uses highlight quotes to share survey responses. Strategy number four are tables. Tables are a great way to organize a large amount of data that is still easy for your audience to review. Here is an example from Wasserman and colleagues. They use tables throughout their evaluation report. You can see here they use a table to show the extended outcome category, definitions, and examples. This is a large amount of data, but is easy to review and consume in this format. Here is one more example from Informal Science. Fitzhugh and colleagues use a combination of table and icons to outline the impacts of their program and relative quotes. Strategy number five is annotated graphs. So annotated graphs are a great strategy to use with mixed methods evaluation, which Lisa was talking about prior. So here you have a bar chart with your quantitative data. Then you add in your qualitative quotes and you've created an annotated graph. So with the addition of the quotes, you have actually expanded the story behind the data and help explain the why. 
So in the first bar, 15 respondents replied professional development. The quotes help explain more details of the story and give the bigger picture. So let's look at some examples. Here is a report from Informal Science where Beaumont included annotated graphs throughout their report. By directly adding the quotes to their charts, it allows the audience to consume the data together and adds that context. Here is an alternative example from DPEC Data Studio. They incorporated a stacked column chart and then added quotes for context. So now we will switch gears to a more visual qualitative strategy. So strategy number six is photos. So photos is a great opportunity to really provide a wealth of context and emotion to your evaluation reports. These examples from informal science allows the audience to really get a feel and look at the project. Remember, if you're planning on using photos in your evaluation report to make sure to get photo releases planned. So here is an example from the field from Char and colleagues. You can see that the photos used throughout their evaluation report with other strategies like highlight quotes as well. Not only do photos help add context, but they are also visually appealing, and this will help your audience be, keep engaged with the content. And here's a second example from Buyer and Flowers. They used photos as they were explaining a five-day field training experience. So not only using descriptive text, but then using photos to add more context. Then they used a second group of photos to show off the participants during presentations. So this helped the audience get a visual understanding of the different activities and the participants in the program. Strategy number seven is icons. So icons are a great way to bring qualitative data to life. So here is a standard bulleted list. But if we add icons, then it allows your eye to absorb more information and provide a little bit more context. Icons are a great way to help your audience navigate your reports and to provide additional visual appeal. Here's an example from Hits Fits You and colleagues. In this report, they used icons for each of their key findings. As a reader, you can easily scan the icons to identify where a new finding begins and what might interest you as a reader. Here's an example from Perry and Wilkerson who received the 2020, 20, 2021 ATE Outstanding Evaluation Reward Report Award and in this report, they used icons for each of their project activities, so you can easily identify where the new activity begins. Strategy number eight are journey maps. So a journey map is a visualization of the process that a person goes through in order to accomplish a goal. So in its most basic form, a journey map starts by compiling a series of user actions into a timeline. As you can see in this example, they mapped out phase one through three and included a timeline, quotes, and experiences. So let's take a look at some examples from the field. So this example from Perry and Wilkerson used a journey map to track the project's academic pathways. This example provides an idea for how you may be able to apply a journey map to an ATE project. You can track the experiences of an ATE student as they consider maybe applying for the program, joining the program, life moments, internships, and graduations, just as an example. And here's an example from Lissa and our colleague Kelly Robertson. The journey map traps a family's experience in the Good Life Guides program. They use a mixture of call-out boxes and icons. This example illustrates how a journey map visualizes an in-depth experience of an individual or group. So now that we've reviewed the eight visualization strategies, we need to think about the data collection methods. So here we have outlined six data collection methods that pair well with the qualitative data methods that Lissa reviewed in section one. So we're not gonna dig too deep into this, but we wanted to provide you with this chart. 
So this chart will help you determine which qualitative visualization strategies might work well for your evaluation plan. And then the final step is to review tools and resources to create these visualizations. And I know a few of you have already asked questions in the chat box about this. So for each of the eight strategies, we've provided tools and resources that can be used to generate these visualizations. So most of these strategies can be completed in either Microsoft Word or PowerPoint, but a few like word clouds take a specialized tool and we've indicated that here for you on this chart. And as I said prior, all the information covered in section three has been combined into a handout that is available to download on our website. So now that we've covered the eight different qualitative evaluation strategies, we'll do a quick activity to see how we can apply them to our evaluation data. So this is an example of the activity we're going to be doing. First, I will read the evaluation scenario that will appear in the pale tail box. Then you will answer the questions. How would you like to dis how would you display the data in this scenario? You can choose from any of the eight strategies we reviewed. So here we go with scenario one. So go ahead and you're going to answer in the chat box. So we just uh, so XYZ, oh, sorry, XYZ evaluation teams has conducted interviews with 28 undergraduate students at Lachlan Community College to gain an understanding of advising for their biological science program. How would you display this da the data in this scenario? So go ahead and answer in the chat box. You can either put in the number or the full name. I'll just give you a full, few moments to answer. So Jean says annotated graphs, highlight quotes from Lissa. Michelle said maybe a journey map, annotated graphs. Rachel says maybe call out boxes or highlight quotes. Yeah. So our recommendation would be a lot of those, right? So there's a lot of opportunities here. So you could use call out boxes, highlight quotes, tables, and annotated graphs are probably gonna be your top four for that. Again, these are just our select, our uh, suggestions. Absolutely, you could fit this into a journey map. And again, these are just suggestions on how you could proceed forward with doing these strategies. So our next uh, activity would be ABC at evaluation team has collected one word responses during an undergraduate lecture of 1,000 undergraduate students. The report will inform the science coordinator of students' reaction to the lecture. Yeah, word cloud, absolutely <laughs> pretty in unanimous. So someone said maybe an annotated graph. Yeah, so let's go ahead. So our suggestion would be word cloud. You could do call out boxes um, and an annotated graphs. Yeah, so it seems like we're all on the same page with that one. So let's move to the last one here. So JKL evaluation team evaluated the process for the Williams College development of their automotive manufacturing 101 course. They need to produce a report for administration to understand the process. What would you say? Kind of unanimous here, coming in journey maps, coming in pretty hard. Yeah, great job guys. Yeah, so we said a journey map or maybe possibly a table. Um, processes certainly are easiest, are probably kind of illustrate on a journey map, but certainly a table would work too if you're not really wanting to get into that more intense visualization. So those are it for our activity. We did want to go ahead and highlight the re award, the report you've seen throughout this presentation a bit. So we just awarded the 2021 Outstanding ATE Evaluation Award to Beth Perry and Stephanie Wilkerson at Magnolia Consulting. And this report is available on our website, and we do encourage you to check it out to see how some of the examples and strategies we covered today can be used. So they, the report uses mixed methods, so it's example both qualitative and quantitative strategies. So again, that's available on the website. You see Lisa just popped the link in there for you, and it also is linked out on our webinar page. So at this time, I'll bring us into our last and final question break of this webinar. So go ahead, if you have any questions, go ahead and enter those in the chat box and we'll get those answered for you. So it looks like Giovanna asked, uh, annotated graphs look great. What software supports that and are they made in the design? Like I can answer that. So uh, annotated graphs, um, what we would recommend is probably using either, you could do it, create the base chart in Microsoft Excel um, and then you could add the, the call out boxes to that one, either in Microsoft PowerPoint or Word. You can also do it right in Excel as well. 
Um, I know some people recommended Canva, Canva for that one as well. So there's a few options, really. It's just kind of piecing those different elements together. Um, so making that quantitative chart and then applying the qualitative piece with the call-out boxes. That's a great question. Lisa, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I was going to say, you know, sometimes, especially when you're using a lot of these different techniques together, designing a report in Word can be very frustrating. I don't know if you all have had that experience where you move something in Word like a centimeter and it throws the whole page off. And so sometimes we actually prefer to design reports in PowerPoint because you just have more flexibility um, to move things around and do creative things. So our next question that came in was from Bethany and they asked, is there a quick way to translate word clouds, boxes, et cetera? All of my reports have to be in two languages. Uh, Bethany, that is a great question. And off the top of my head, I don't have your answer. I'm hoping maybe someone in the community or Alyssa might have an answer for you. We can certainly get the answer if we can't get it answered now. If anyone knows if they can answer in the chat box. That would be super helpful. And Bethany will certainly track down that answer for you and get back to you. Okay, so just for contrast, can you give a quick example of a project that would not benefit from a qualitative or mixed method evaluation? I'm gonna throw this one over to Lissa. Great question. My personal response would be no because I do believe, I personally believe that most evaluations really do benefit from having some qualitative aspects in there. However, I do really think that it depends on the project and it depends on the evaluation questions that people want answered and the perspective of the stakeholders. So say the project is really looking to answer uh, long-term impact questions about specifically graduation rates and whether or not something changed graduation rates. That's all. That's all they want to know. And their assumptions and their beliefs really prioritize quantitative data and numbers. And I can see an evaluation that would be best that really did keep to a quantitative approach. Um, but again, me, my first question would then be, you know, how did this happen and, and why and what did students feel and how did we get here? So I still think it would benefit from some qualitative data. All right, uh, let's see, Joy asked, do you recommend any particular software for journey maps? I'm, I'm gonna, gonna defer to Lissa because she actually has created one of these and that was one of our examples. So Lissa? You know, really just PowerPoint. I think that Microsoft Office Suite has a lot to offer and working between them, you know, you can make some graphs in Excel if you want, but then PowerPoint really does have a lot of flexibility for you to create um, different things, particularly when it comes to journey maps. So I found it helpful to do some searches online and find some designs that I thought worked for my context and my data, um, and then kind of uh, be inspired from there. Emma, before you launch the next question, I do just want to go ahead and, and launch our feedback survey. Um, we, we do look at all of this data very closely, um, and it's really helpful for us to improve our webinars. So we will certainly stay on for the additional two minutes to answer additional questions, but um, please take some time to respond to our feedback survey. Absolutely, our next question came in from Kathleen. They said, are there any techniques that you would consider that address accessibility concerns around such strategies such as word clouds, icons, and journey maps? It's a great question and something that I think is difficult as we're trying to be more creative in our reporting techniques and more visual and more engaging, trying to think about accessibility concerns as well get, gets tangled. Um, but I think alt text is your best friend. Um, I think also realizing that if your audience does have more accessibility concerns, that is something that you want to take into account, making sure that you have really descriptive figure um, labels. So even if you have a really visual graphic and then you have alt text behind it, making sure that you have a really plain, straightforward explanation of what's happening in the figure it might even include important percentages, right? So not just this is a graph of um, this data, but actually spelling out the first item is 60%, the second item is 30% is and so on. 
And I just actually shared um, a, an article, a blog from AEA 365 in the community this morning, all about accessibility and how you can actually use icons to help with some accessibility and really about how to simplify and streamline your, your reporting. So definitely pop over to the community, check that article out. Um, like I said, it just came out this morning from a, a colleague at Western Michigan University with us. And it was really fascinating to read and kind of think about how accessibility might look differently um, to different groups. So, and also always remember to check your stuff um, with color color blindness as well. Um, there's some great acts of resources on our site and we're happy to share those as well, but that's another feature of that accessibility feature as well. All right, looks like we've got one more here. Uh, so Anita said, if you have Visio, it also makes it a bit easier to make visuals, journey maps, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. So Microsoft Visio is a great program if you happen to have it. Um, I know our systems don't anymore, um, but it's really, um, if you're going to get into making logic models or journey maps, it might be something you want to look into. You can also do a lot of those functions, as Lissa said, in Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, and there's a lot of good online resources you could check out as well. Um, I know that they're starting to implement some of the Visio's features um, on some of our online software, such as Jabber um, and the other um, whiteboard softwares that are out there. So we're always happy to answer questions and talk about this for hours. Um, but unfortunately, that actually brings us to the end of our webinar today. Um, we would like to encourage you to check out our monthly web chat series that we have. Um, our 2022 schedule is uh, we've launched quarter one on the website, so you can go ahead and check out those. And our web chats are uh, small group discussions around various topics each month. So we hope to see you in 2022. Um, this does conclude our webinar today. And we want to thank you all so much for coming. If you have additional questions, please hop on the Slack network or email Lissa or I, and we are happy to address those with you. And as always, thanks for coming. So good to see all of you and have a great uh, holiday season. Thank you.